That's right. Crickets. I think we missed uh, August this year. I think we're all done. We didn't get our fourth season. I think we're moving right into fall. The crickets are still content on where they are. I don't know why. Hopefully today I'll show you some things. Maybe I can show you some things that uh, really explain maybe how easy a lot of this is or not. I, I don't know what, what people think about it. I don't get too much response on uh, all this stuff. Those that do respond in earnest, we, we seem to do very well. And I uh, don't know why that seems to be a problem for the rest. So I'm glad to have those few that do. At least makes us know, a few of us know that we're doing uh, doing some things that are, well, you, they work. Uh, they work all the time. It just takes a while. And I think a lot of the ignorance uh, that we have in the, in the, in the society is, is something that we have to work, work to and through. Uh, we can't just take our ideas and drop them off uh, into the application because I think we're completely lacking in awareness of really what we're up against and where everyone's mindset has been gone and conditioned for at least 20 or 30 years. So I'm going to go through something, and I hope may not be, uh, some of you may be understanding what I've been talking about for years and years. When I tell you some of this stuff is really quick to cut through, uh, it, 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 it's just a matter of how much research you've done that's accurate. Not relying on what it shows, uh, or the opinions on the internet and opinions of people actually looking at the black and white first, going there first, wherever you can find it. And then moving out from there to say, look at anybody who's looking at that black and white and looking and listening for the interpretation of whether it's accurate or not. This broadcast will be. BTWRLM284. And I think I'm going to show us here a betrayal. I wasn't even going to talk about this, but today, in the last two days, last night and today, it became apparent we've got a lot of things working toward a problem that's developing. And part of this for me is not really a problem, it's really an awareness. And the system and this thing that's set up around us is. Well, it's planned, and so the problem with that is we have to understand how that method works. I don't even know how I get stopped. There's so much to understand, and there's so little to know, uh, really. Uh, the, there's so much to understand on how we've been convoluted. It's so little to know on really how to deal with it once we see it. And so this is the my problem with some of this discussion. If people just got involved, they would see exactly what, what they're up against, they would be able to address it. The thing that's come up here is a decision on the against the, the miners. It was a lawsuit that we advised not to jump into because it started out wrong, and uh, that's critical to understand. Uh, part of this problem is cre its self-inflicted wound, and it's done by ignorance. When as I tell everyone, a lot of time the answer is in the black and white already. And we're dealing in a system of official system of corruption. And it's not something that uh, people want to want to understand or, or agree to or really fully appreciate. That it's such a subtle deception that pe it misses, it pe mostly everyone is missing it, uh, even till like right now. So I wanted to dis I wanted to dis uh, to discuss a thing I wouldn't I wasn't thinking about discussing because of some of the nuances. We also don't want to give too much here as telegraphing to the enemies that listen to me uh, to defend against this thing and make a lot of noise and try to justify their position. But I do want to explain how simple and easily the, the issues with the uh, the courts and wrongful lawsuits and the bar association members bringing forth the wrong arguments. They sound like they're doing it. The, the right thing, and then and you then when you know the subject matter, you realize they're totally not doing it, and then you find out if you knew before. And I've discussed discussed this before. Uh, it this thing should have never these things should never come to the point where you have the legal system the, the, making any decisions. And all of that is sitting in the black and white already, and they'll tell you that that's sitting there if you know what you're looking at. But they adulterate it. They these people that are in the seats of decision are the ones that advance these decisions to be made. There was a lawsuit that was passed to try and stop a state law. We advised not to ha get involved uh, with that because it was a wrong group of people doing the wrong way and not getting it to get the right answer. So we 
I said, we, the Jefferson Mining District, stepped back, did not offer much more of anything because there's not much to tell these people. Uh, they, again, I'll just simply say that you ask, you get yourself into a question that you shouldn't be and you're, you're asking for it. Then you get that question in before someone who's going to, where appropriate, take advantage of you. It's not a good deal in the outcome. And you could have stopped that before it got started is the wrong, asserting a question at all where one isn't and then getting the right answer from the wrong question. And so this is a double, double wrong, double, two steps wrong in the beginning that I want to now go through a decision to show you, even though some of you may not understand a lot of it, you've heard me talk about it. I've talked about all this. It underlies, it underlies all your rights for ingress and egress, your highways. It underlies your property rights. and underlies all this stuff that's being subverted. And it's in a decision that's come down, and then subsequent and coincident rule modification that's coming to show us another thing. It also shows what I've been telling all of you all that are into this, uh, the situation with the mining law. It'll to explain, re, re, reconfirm what I've been telling you about the consistencies of this and expose to us how betrayed we're all being by the system of those that look like they have the expertise to argue your rights better than you. And this is now for all of you all listening. Arguing, someone else arguing your rights better for you is a loser. And so if you don't, this is a simple way to get at the, how they do it. That's why I'm going to tell you all and get it on the record here a bit. But I've got to be careful, again, not to get out too much. I'm going to give you just enough to show you how it got off. But there's so much to, dis to discuss here and decide. And we're still in the middle of deciding what we really want to do, not to this case, but relative to the comment that's come up for the very rule that they're saying is Im imposed in this case that I've already explained to you can't be exposed, imposed. It just, it, there's no authority for it, and no one wants to read the black and white and listen to that. They'd rather listen to uh, bar members, attorneys, tell you, tell everybody that that's not the case. But you have to look and see how they adulterate things, and it's all silent to you if you don't understand the subject matter. When I say learn the battlefield, you truly have to learn the battlefield, all the nuances of it. In your life and your property and your rights, all the rights you think you have, you see them disappearing and you complain about that, but you have no clue about how they've done it to you, how they're going to continue and how it's going to completely go away from you all of a sudden. As I also explained, they bring in your your Second Amendment gun rights into, or excuse me, your, uh, key, your arms rights. They bring them into an administrative context and then give you the privilege to be able to buy the gun in a discrimination suit, which is totally outside of the the jurisdiction of the uh, commission to decide, uh, which you'll find in this case here that I'm going to talk about, and also uh, w within the context of what it applies to. So this is how they're taking us down. And here, So this case is a case, a whole bunch of people jump together to uh, try and defend the miners against a lawsuit, uh, excuse me, a, a, state, uh, a state environmental law that went in. Uh, and our lawsuit in 2013 answered this uh, by the, the state defaulting the judge committing fraud on the on the court on the court itself, uh, the, admitting they didn't have jurisdiction, admitting they didn't have didn't have the authority, did, admitting it was the wrong court that that stole the case. But see, the default in equity still runs, and it's still in default. It's still binding, as I've told you. This this the question was determined in 2013. I believe this case was instituted in order to try and throw that question out. The problem is it can't ever throw it out because. We spoke in the law, and they're speaking about administrative impositions. And the court, so-called justices of a appellate court, have just come back to say, yeah, the state has authority to do all this stuff. In other words, you're subject to the administration and the permits that you need to go to, to work on a grant. In fact, they never say that, but that's what the imposition will be. Uh, this case uh, has a, an appeal that's gone through. I listened to the presentation, uh, it was on the internet, uh, of the attorney who who uh, presented this. It was completely a bogus condition. Uh, the justices, the, the, the appellate judges, so-called, the black-robed ones, completely inferior. Uh, notwithstanding that the jurisdiction is incompetent. Remember, the appellate courts that we have, uh, in this in this case it's the West Coast Ninth Circuit, Ninth Circus, we can call it, uh, 71, sorry, 72% wrong. When they finally get into the Supreme Court from the from the Ninth Circus, they're overturned 71, 72%. So th this is this justice is a joke to begin with. But you watch the uh, incompetence of the court taking on the decision of an incompetent court. What am I talking about? 
Uh, I've talked to you about all of this. Some of you done the research, and I appreciate that you did. Uh, the, these are United States District Courts. They're not District Courts of the United States. It's a subtle change, but it's an important change. District Courts, there's District Courts of the United States, given the statutes uh, are, are accurate. There's only two of them, and they're Article Three Courts. They're of Article Three con uh, competency. They're co considered a constitutional court. The United States District Court, unlike the District Court of the United States, the United States District Court is just a territorial court. And so you, the appellate courts, the general circuit appellate courts, are simply reviewers of un territorial court decisions. The rights of, a, of any property owner relative to a grant of Congress is an Article Three subject matter. And so they're violating us secretly right in front of our face. And I've, again, I've talked about this. But I'm not here to say that uh, to to more uh, to point at that point that out any more today. But to mention it to remind you, this whole thing is on a false premise uh, over and over. But let me get to this. Uh, what is this? Uh, page 19. Uh, I didn't read this. Or I didn't read the opinion. I determined what this would be before, a long time ago, years and years ago. It's turning out to be that way. But I'm interested to see whether or not I can find the fatal error that will be in these cases. I predicted a long time ago will be there. And so it came apparent because a bunch of people we got involved talking about quickly referencing this new rule that's coming for this thing, this rule that they're imposing. They want to change it. And a very important change is coming. And it's consistent with the consistency of what it applies to, which is very important to identify. Before we get there, we want to talk about this case because these miners, these people that jumped on this lawsuit, uh, for whatever all the reasons that they were, uh, good, bad, or indifferent, uh, they were attempting to vindicate some rights that were violated, and they did it wrong. They uh, come in underneath this one rule that they want to now change to make it more conforming, but they came in when they didn't have a need to. When they handed it to the court, and then the attorney argued it completely wrong, well, they talk about the rights and the property, but they give lip service to it all. The uh, court comes back and mealy-mouths this whole thing, makes it real difficult to see when if you have the background, if you understand the the basis for this, you understand what they're leaving out. Again, the silence is our killer here. But for me, the silence is the cricket that becomes the, our problem. And I get to identify where the cricket was in this case, and there's bunches of them. And it's really simply failing to acknowledge certain, what I would call, tell you, it's called considered savings clause, clauses. They save prior authorities, prior rights, prior this, prior that, whatever the thing that they're supposed to be subject to these rules. This court case in page 19, I just typed in, I wanted to know whether or not, in this case, Part 228s were applied at all. That's all I wanted to know in this case. And I, without, I'll show you why I, I believe that. Uh, I wanted to know that because I know that if it's applied to an uncommon mineral miner, that was a wrongful imposition. What do you ask? What, what do you mean about wrongful imposition, a rule that's applied by an agency? Well, they have no jurisdiction. And I talked about this in the fire discussion, we're going to go to the very same rule. And one of the rules that, they ref that they'll reference the, the code to comes up again, and you've already heard the answer to this. And so I just want to know, is the Part 228 even involved in this thing? Well, sure enough, I just part I'll load, the, later on you get the link. It's a Ninth Circus Court opinion. I just type in, I find 228. Just look for the word, the, the term 228. Up, part, up pops, I think it was page 19, the very first instance that it pops up, 19 pages in. Let me read you this one page, because then it is, the, is the, the key to the whole, the keys to the kingdom here of how wrong we're being done as people and how wrong people that consider themselves minors are not really in that status and how wrong down the road they're being sent. Federal laws governing national forests, it was number two in this page 19 of this PDF document. The Organic Administration Act, 30 Statute 11, 35 to 36 in 1897, provides that nothing in 16 U.S.C. 473 to 82 and 551, quote, shall, dot, 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 prohibit any per person from entering upon, dot, 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 national forests for all proper and lawful purposes, including that of prospecting, locating, and developing the mineral resources thereof. 16 U.S.C. 478 also provides, however, that, quote, such persons must comply with rules and regulations covering such national forests, close quote. 
The Organic Act, moreover, requires the Secretary of Agriculture to, quote, make provisions for the protection against destruction of fire and depredation, depredations upon the public forests and national forests, close quote. And it authorizes the Secretary to, quote, make such rules and regulations regarding occupancy and use as may be necessary to preserve the forest thereon from destruction, See section 551. I hope some of you are taking notes. I'm pausing a little bit on some of these numbers because we're going to go visit these numbers real quickly. And they go through and I'm going to understand the dot, dot, dots are, are, are a clue as what's going on here. And we've learned very clearly to go look inside those dot, dot, dots to find out how they're mucking up the works here, how they may be misstating it, how they may be altering the context and those dot, dot, dots tell us there's a silence that needs to be researched, that's not being spoken, that is may very well be material and pertinent to what we're trying to analyze. Under this rulemaking authority, under this rulemaking authority, is what they just read. That was what? 473 to, 480, uh, to, to 482? 551? Uh, 478 being inside there? Those are the sections that they give underneath the 1897 Act. A lot of stuff to keep track of here, but if you don't have never read this, it might be a little confusing, but it's really not. When you go back and read it, you'll find out there's a hierarchy to things. Let me finish. Under that rulemaking authority, the U.S. Forest Service has promulgated rules regulating mining on national forest lands. These regulations require mining operators, mining operators, to comply with applicable federal and state air quality standards, water quality standards, and standards for the disposal and treatment of solid waste. See 36 CFR Part 228.8A to C. I searched to see whether or not the Part 228s were there. Why? Because in doing the research, I know where the Part 228s come from. And they're not, from their origins, applicable to minors, grantees. Notice it said mining operators. We're talking grantees here, not operators. And this is the interesting problem with dialogue and language and terms. But let me go through really quickly here, because I'm not going to do the full analysis on this. I already know that 228 their origins. I know they're not applicable. But let's go back up and just look at some of these, uh, some of these citation authorities. And in this decision... Uh, and in the rule coming uh, that they mentioned, they mentioned that the forest reserves were created from the public land uh, and reserved. And in the rule change they're coming, they explain that that was the reservation upon which they can go. You, they can determine the rules applicable to mining, pulling, extracting minerals, the uncommon minerals, not the commons, but the uncommons. And this is the other distinction. We have, we have these two, two classes that are treated differently under the law. But let me go to that Organic Act. Let me remind you here. I've talked about some of this before. Uh, there was something before 1897, which created these forest reserves, which is actually called the Creative Act of 1891, which actually did create the forest reserves. And it was what it was amended before. And so we have a lineage to go back to that no one mentions here, but we have to go back to that and look and see what they did and see, again, if they amended it, what did they change it to? But one thing they didn't do is consistent and moved on through was things I told you they need to save before. Now, let's just do a chronological study. 1897 is after 1891. I think we can agree with that. And anything prior to that that was reserved or obligations of the United States, such as maybe the grant of the minerals to the people, would be an encumbrance upon that second second reservation. In other words, it would be a reservation inside the second re the first reservation they're making by 1897 because it has to be saved. All highways would be saved. Anything prior would be saved. And so I'm looking now to see what would be saved. Well, anything that was a grant before uh, 1891 was 1872 prior to 1891. Sure, was 1870. That's the lo the the um, Placer Act, sure. Is 1866? Sure. All that's before. That was a grant underneath the obligation of Congress to do so of the dominant estate to the people. It sits in trust. 
that it forever will have to be a, have to be protected, given we have a nation of, of laws and a, a people who would honor them and accountability to those. But let me see if we can find the reservation. In the Organic Act of the Forest Service, they're claiming is their authority to, to regulate mining. And then let's go see if those regulations, in fact, do that, and to what regard. Paragraph on this uh, link you'll get, you can read it, page 4. All waters of such reservations of these forest reserves may be used for domestic mining, for domestic mining, milling, and irrigation purposes under the laws of the state wherein such forest reserves are situated, or under the laws of the United States and the rules of regulations established therein. Well, the laws of the United States, once they're appropriated, go into the state. So that's your state law of follow and how you appropriate the water. But the water and the lawful uses are determined by uh, to be mi mining, milling, and irrigation. Well, where does that authority come? All waters of such reserves may be used. That comes from the 1866 Act. So this is a, another preservation clause for that grant to people to go into the forest to get these things, this thing, water, for these, these uses. Second, next paragraph here, upon the record, so that's a savings clause to the water that was granted back in 1866, section 9. Upon the recommendations of the Secretary of Interior, this is the Forest, uh, forest Reserves Act, uh, Establishment Act, upon which 1905 the Forest Service is created to manage over. This is the Secretary of Interior because this is a public land being reserved. So you understand these hierarchies. Upon the recommendation of Secretary of Interior, the approval of the President, uh, with the approval of the President, Notice there's two decisions here. These become domestic type treaty type obligations as well. When there's a concurrence here, you'll see they're powerful, they're tied to these obligations. After 60 days notice, there are published in two papers of general circulation in the state or territory therein any forest reserve is situated and near the said reservation. Any public lands embraced within the limits of any forest reserve which after due de examination or personal inspection of a competent person appointed for the purpose of the Secretary of Interior shall be found better adapted for mining or for agricultural purposes than for forest usage may be restored to the public domain. And any mineral lands in any forest reserve which have been or which may be shown to be such and such entry under the existing mining laws of the United States and the rules and regulations applying thereof shall continue to be subject to location and entry, notwithstanding any provisions herein contained, notwithstanding any conditions of the establishment of this forest reserve. In other words, we read again, the prior grants are reserved, they're a reservation before the reservation of the forest, and they are not underneath the regulation authority of the forest in this case, now it's the Forest Service, Department of the Agriculture. Now, another thing, in 1976, we see FLIPMA, the Federal Land Management Policy Act, come together and bring these two organizations and, adult, and, uh, and adulterate their power, <coughs> actually condition some of their power, too. So don't let's leave that out there, remembering that that comes in the future. But there's a coming of a combining of authority here coming in the future. But here is, notwithstanding any provision herein contained, in 1897, nothing in the grants to the water, to the ingress and egress, or to the mineral land, or to the agriculture in this case, are actually under the authority. They're a reserve outside of the authority of the Forest Service. Okay, so the, but you go back to that court decision, and it says subject to the rules and regulations there. Well, and this is where the silence is. But if you go read the Acts, you see there's reservations where they're not going to be able to have those authorities. I'm going to focus here on the mining. I'm going to focus on the ingress and egress. They didn't talk about the ingress and egress except to the point, if you know, to read for the fact of the entry. Shall continue to be subject to such location and entry. Entry is that you have to be able to go there to find the, to get the entry to locate. And so we, if you know to read, work, read the words, the black and white tells us there's a right of ingress and egress built in. Where did I get that? That's the 1866 Act of Section 8. Not 9, but 8. This is your road laws of your states and all the statutory acceptances that should be sitting there that no federal agency has authority over. And what did I talk to you about last two weeks ago or so when I was talking about the fire orders cannot keep out 
There's no delegation of power to the forest agent of employees to interfere with things underneath the national mining or the national mining law, general mining law. I read it to you. It's already there. We're going to go back there to show you. I'll remind you of it. So how is it that this court case can say there's rules and regulations? It only does it in silence. It imposes upon these, these uh, people that call themselves minors, advanced to the argument advanced by an attorney, put before more attorneys in black robes, to, to, on an issue that's not does it non-existent actually, to make a decision to become authority that everyone believes is, is lawful, and for these parties and why I told everyone not to jump in this one, uh, this will be binding on them. And this is the the, the interesting part of this. Is there's an answer before all this as well, so I'm hold on for that too. But so we go back to. We look now in the organic act they use, and we see there's an exception to the authority. Well, now let's move on to the rules regarding the entry and location of a mining claim. And we'll hear within the context of the 473 to, what, 483, whatever it was, what did they say over there? 482, 473 to 482, and 551. They say there's another authority. So let's go look at the rule now. And this rule... This is a code, excuse me, that they reference as an authority to the Forest Service. And what it relates to here is it says, nothing in sections 473 to 478, 479, 482, and 551 of this title shall be construed as prohibiting the egress and ingress of actual settlers residing within the boundaries of national forests or from crossing the same to and from their property or homes, their property or homes, and such wagon roads and other improvements may be constructed thereon as may be necessary to reach their homes and to utilize their property under such rules and regulations as may be prescribed by the Secretary of Agriculture, nor shall anything in such sections prohibit any person from entering upon the National Forest for all purposes and proper and lawful purposes, including that of prospecting, locating, and developing the mineral resources thereof. Such persons must comply with the rules and regulations covering such national forests. He says, oh, there's authority right there. Well, it says applicable rules, and let's go to those rules. You see here, here's 551. This is a critical understanding. What is? What can they do? If you're granted the right of entry, and you're only doing that. Is there a regulation authority to permit you? Absolutely not. What they end up talking about here will be the ones that you will talk about is the common minerals, where you have to make a road that may be temporary because your property is the mineral, not the land. Not the land reserved to the people and claimed by entry location notices. So we have to, mis it says, must comply with the rules and regulations. I'm just reading out of the thing. Let's go to those rules and regulations. Let's identify what this property is that's under the rules and regulations. CFR 36, CFR 251. Let's go back to that court case. It said CFR 228. It also said Part 551. I want to go and find out what are we talking about with the implementation of Part 51 as well. And we see 251, uh, 5.5. All uses of national forest system lands, improvements and resources, improvements and resources, except those authorized by the regulations governing share use of roads, grazing, livestock use, sale and disposition of timber, and special forest products such as greens and mushrooms and medicinal plants, and uh, minerals under Part 228 are designated special uses. Before conducting a special use, individuals or entities must submit a proposal to the authorized officer it must obtain a special use authorization for the author, authorized officer unless the requirement is waived by paragraphs C through E3 of this section. And let me go back to the beginning. Did you miss it? All uses of the national forest lands, improvements, and resources, except those authorized by the regulations governing the share use of roads, in this case minerals, under Part 228, are special uses. Folks, that's the definition I told you under FLIPMA that acknowledges that these these uses that are accepted from this, these are specific uses. Mining development, mineral development is a specific use, not a special use. 
So by that, looking and looking at the black and white, we realize these are not within the regulatory authority of the Forest Service. By that statute alone, it says this is treated differently. And so if it said applicable rules. This tells us that we're in specific use. FLIPMA says now specific use is not to be interfered with. And so the silence of, in the court decision is deafening. The crickets are screaming here. And that's what's defeating us, because the crickets win. If you've got any crickets, they win. It's the silence of the actual law, the actual power, the actual assertion of rights. And so you lose. So here we have the scope of this imposition implementing 2551 determines that mineral use is, is, is a specific use, not a special use. Now let's get over to the 261s, which implement the 551 and how it works. Remember, this is the fire prohibitions. There's a prohibition on the delegation of authority of the federal employee, Forest Service employee, against their authority, right here at 261.1b. Nothing in this part shall preclude activities as authorized by Wilderness Act of 1964 or the U.S. Mining Law Acts of 1872. So where is the, uh, this all-powerful authority? They don't even write regulations that you can see that can regulate because nothing can interfere with this. Why? Because they're a grant. The condition comes when you have a common mineral material that has the right in the mineral and not the land, as I said before where you're going to probably be there temporarily while you min mine the mineral that's sold or leased. And I won't get into acquired lands and other things. Those are, those are a lot smaller percentage of the land and are not, not relevant, but they would be in the context of where we're going. So in the, in the instance of the regulations being all powerful, when you go read the rules and find, find the fact of it, the ingress, your highway rights are granted to not be interfered with. But certainly the ones that are already there cannot even be changed. Why? Because they're put into state law. Everything that's disposed goes into state law. So when we go back to that court case and decides and says that there's regulations thereof, when you go read the silence in the, in the court case, it doesn't point out there's savings clauses pro prohibiting this activity. It looks like the court is correct here, when in fact it's totally wrong. It's correct, there's rules, but those rules even reflect the granted authorities. And they're pro the regulations are prohibited from interfering. And I won't get into the problem of the 1976. We'll only be talking about ingress and egress made since then. And even that has a condition. And I won't, we're not here to talk about it. I'm talking about how we can clearly see how the courts are betraying us. And it's so simple to go into the black and white, stop stop excusing ourselves from not understanding, go right to where we need to look, and read for the rules they're telling us apply, and find out that the courts themselves are misapplying the totality of the rules in the context. In this case, the miners are, in this appellate court decision, the, these miners so-called lost. They're upholding the state regulation. But they're only doing that because the 228s, under which the, the attorney advised their client, it's like cha-ching here, set up for the takedown. The attorney advised the filing of a 228 plan of operations. And the plan of operations under the federal requires you go look to the state for the permitting. And there's your linkage now to the state law that doesn't actually apply if you do this thing correctly. Now the 228s, I understand, are the implement, implementation of what? I've talked to you all about this. There's nothing I'm telling you today that I haven't talked about. In trying to expose to you, all the answers are in the black and white in these contexts to show us how we need to proceed into the future uh, while we've been underneath the burden of being ignorant, while we've been under the burden of not being able to think correctly. We can retrain ourselves to think better. Remember that decision said that the rulemaking authority of the United States uh, Forest Service for promulgating rules for mining on national forest lands is written, and then they de designate 228. They said that in the other one. It's specific use, it's not a special use under 228. So what is 228? 
228 was the rules implementing what code? See, the rules implement something. The 551s they mentioned were implemented by the 261s. One's a code USC and one's a CFR, Code of Federal Regulation. In that code, it says, don't interfere with the accessing. There's a whole law that you have the right to enter in there. Don't interfere. We, sh we, sue that we see that was a prohibition against an order, of mandatory order of fire evacuation. We see that it pertains to the whole of the 261s implementing all of the 551s. And so what rules are actually applicable in this case that the court was referencing, that the, that the so-called miners lose by? See what the miners didn't understand, don't understand, and they won't get this. They won't quite get. They they want to. They buck me by going through and getting an attorney that will buck Hal. And they will not present this thing correctly because they present it at all. I'm saying you don't go to court to get a, a, a decision because you stay out of court. Where I see these regulations, the regulatory authority is absent. Why are we even in the court? Why don't we just simply make an administrative letter obstruction challenge that says you don't have the authority and it's right here and here? Why, when we do that, does that seem to answer the question that why is the guys that we help, that we help in Jefferson Mining District and myself outside, whatever, they don't even want to come into the district, that's fine. Everyone's got their choices. This is a voluntarism, you want to say it, the original type of voluntarism. They still listen. When they listen and they file the right letter, whether this is BLM or Forest Service, we use this this lack of application of the rules to mining, uh, there's no more discussion. It never gets to court. It's the improper imposition. It's the agreeable, agreeing to the attorneys that say you have to file a plan of operation under Part 228. Well, what's Part 228? I've told you. It's the implementation of what code? The, it's the law, the NEPA law, the National Environmental Policy Act. It implements that. Oh, there's an environmental constraint. Oh, we're going to be regulated. Well, is that what it says? I, I brought all this up before, folks. Is if you apply the NEPA, it says there's, there's going to be, what, productive and enjoyable harmony between man's, man and man's environment. Is this fight, is going to court, an adversarial war, sitting, uh, war setting, is that peaceful? Is that enjoyable? Is that productive? No, it's a complete violation. But 228s implement NEPA. NEPA relates to what? Miners? Grantees? Who? Cities? County? State? Who? What? What does NEPA apply to that the Forest Service has re is required to make regulations for? Well, when you look in this, and I'm going to make a simple discussion here, because they've ex the courts have expanded this a bit to really include just about anything that money is spent for projects on. So it's the finance, the bottom line. But let's, in the most s simple look for this broadcast, NEPA applies to major federal actions. If I didn't know the origins of 228, when I go to read the terms, it says major federal actions. Are, are grantees or road access, is that a major federal action or is that a private action? If it's a private action, which it is, if you said if you said anything other than private, then you need to go kind of listen a little bit more. Uh, these are private actions. These are all instituted by people accepting the disposal authority that Congress granted of the public lands to the people in the states. These are all private actions. Miners don't don't make locations entry and location locations and entries for all you all. They make it for themselves under the promise that they'll be able to peacefully extract the minerals for you all. And to, that was done in such a long time ago, it essentially uh, it's reserved before and, and protected before any other subsequent act. And you'll see this is the savings clause. The 228s are for the National Environmental Policy Act. That was in 1969. That was when this environmental imposition, but if you look very carefully, the NEPA only applies for fed major federal actions, the location of the minerals of which is not a major federal action. It's a private action. It doesn't even apply by its own terms. But is it truly applicable at all? They said the court said you have to file 228s. Well, yeah, you do have to follow the 228s, but do you, particularly the man or woman that's going to do a mining claim or go on the highway, 
by the terms of the NEPA, you don't. Well, is it is it 228's NEPA? Well, yes, and they finally admitted to it. I, I've been I've been the only one who understood how they finally tracked down the numbering s s sequence change. And they would for years, ten years, they haven't mentioned this. They finally mentioned it in the in the trying to explain you know, how the new rule why it needs to why it needs to be conformed with the BLM side, the Secretary of Interior. There's a, a part of the law, a rules part, before 228, it's called Part 252, which were solely and only the implementation of the National Environmental Policy Act. They were renumbered. There was a little bitty act that renumbered this, this provision into 228. Now, for all y'all that will be researching this, and hopefully some of you will, lots of you should, because it's just a nice, simple when I'm talking to you, it's a simple line, sentences to read. The NEPA is for the Environmental Policy Act. National, National Environmental Policy Act is implemented by agencies because of major federal actions. The location and entry of mineral, uncommon minerals is none of which can be applied to them. That a plan of operations or a bond would be applicable. Given that's the law, why does this court speak that the regulation upon these people is through the 228s? It is a fraud on the court, folks. Not the court. The, ju the judges, the rub, the justices here, and the attorneys, and the judge and the lower, the ju magistrate at the lower court, all committing fraud on the due process pro problem. None of them are saying, which they had the duty to say, is that this case is not proper before the court because the underlying orders, the plan of operations was improperly imposed. No, they take advantage of the condition. You pay for it, and they take advantage to take your property rights. We find in the rules no application of any rule that can be put onto the mining, yet the court says the 228s are applicable, and that has to only be in context of a major federal action. Where is that stated, what they're doing is a major federal action in that case? You won't see it. That's the cricket. That's the one that's killing us. So let's move up. So that's the miners are going to, so-called miners, I call them so-called because they didn't come in as grantees. They might have come in as miners, as common mineral miners. They all agree that the, the 1955 Act uh, it makes them subject. They all agree they don't have property rights. They only agree they have the right to the mineral, not the land. If that was the case, then why does the mining uh, grant uh, give exclusive uh, possession and use to the, uh, within the limits of the claim? to the whole land, and to the mineral. That's another silence. Now, they'll talk about it, but they won't enforce it. You see what the court does to hide that. Well, let's go over to what this uh, Federal Register new rule thing that came up. And I won't read the whole thing. This is a comment thing that you can do, uh, I suppose. Uh, be careful when you when you do this. Uh, but because you'll again you just say the wrong stuff you you they won't listen to you in in one regard because they they know you're off point but let me go down and read a little bit of what I was just telling you tying it all together even in the background discussion and then the in the rule set they tell you they they propose to you how they believe this is supposed to be again uh, silence is inside the details in the silence here and the, uh, all these authorities, they write, 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 and, you, and your mind goes numb, your eyes roll back, and you don't think about it. But when you start applying what this stuff does, you start to find out that maybe there's a tall tale here or a non-disclosure of the truth and the law properly applied. And this now conditions how you respond. In 1974, this, this comment period goes on, or comment uh, to background. They talk about the mining law authorizing, authorizing prospecting. They mention the Organic Act again, the 478, the 482s. They make a partial disclosure of it, just like the court case does. And they go on and say, in 1974, under authority granted to the Forest Service by the Organic Act of 1897, 16 U.S.C. 478, 482, and 551, the Forest Service adopted regulations at Code 36 Code of Federal Regula Regulations, CFR Part 252, which were later redesignated at 36 CFR Part 228, Part A, Subpart A, 
to regulate operations conducted on the certain no, no, national forest system lands under the 19, 1872 as amended 30 USC 20, 50, 22, section 22 to 54, the mining law. Now, let's go back to the uh, last half hour that I've been talking about this. We pointed out the authority was not in the 1870, 1897. It reserved the minerals away from that. And in the rules, they say, there are specific use regulated by 228. We found in 551, nothing shall interfere with the ingress and egress, at least. And we find if we go to NEPA, excuse me, FLIPMA, they'll say that it's a specific use that is, is immune because you have to regard the ingress and egress and the rights to mine, development and extract. These name the very same authorities as the court case. And the court case adulterates by silence and on full disclosure, fraud and fraud on the court, the actual implementation of the authority here. And this rule states it in a very similar way. I always find, I've seen this before, we had this 228 uh, problem uh, years and years ago. We, we were able to defeat that with the help of advo advocacy, Small Business Administration of all things. They have, a, they have a trusteeship oversight of this whole thing, the whole process. And the, the Forest Service couldn't meet that process, and so it failed. They still implemented the Part 228 in silence, and there's no accountability to it. We know the difference, so we know we cut right through all that. But this re comment period code for the rule lays out the authorities just like the court case does. Uh, but we now know the court case subverts the actual authorities in silence and doesn't mention it. Here, they mention the 252s were the origins of the Part 228s. And the 252s, the silence here is the 252s with the implementation of NEPA. And so underneath this grand background, and really the misstatement of lawful application of law, this rule is coming forward to do something with the 228s to bring them in conformity with the 3809s, which I've talked to you about, about I've had a couple broadcasts about the 3809s on the Stac Secretary of Interior side and the BLM. So the rule that they're trying to they they give notice, this is a fraudulent notice now, to have everyone comment on is invalid as against the proper application, and they want to make it look like they have authority. I just read to you that they don't but they want to make it look like they have authority. They're speaking just like the courts. How is that correlation that way when the court had to adulterate the law that these people speak the same way and adulterate it in the same way? How is this already not a setup for the takedown? They've been pushing this angle for quite a while. And they keep getting the so-called law uh, legal precedent that this is the way it is. And it's all a fraud. That they are silent that there has to be a major federal action if Part 228s are applicable at all. And I'm going to suggest to you, if given, the NEPA says that you have to have a hearing over impacting man's environment, which is his rights to the land and his minerals that you have hold in trust for him and her, you would have to have a NEPA consideration. This has to go through the NEPA process because in this rule you're impacting that without a hearing violates that whole premise on its face and they don't mention that up in this background that the 252s were NEPA and not applicable to regulate locatable minerals though they make the claim is no different the fraud that's being done by the court case the miners just lost out in other words I, I think keeps on it I want to say something the the fact that the miners went in and, and, and attacked a, a law sued this state law and then didn't provide the, for, the right administrative background, and they moved in to sue and bring a whole bunch of people in, uh, and one of the causes for the wrongness was the disability is not mining law. Again, remember, they threw in a disability case to try and get your rights, no different than the employment discrimination suits are saying you have the right to buy a, an arm. These uh, mining sites says, oh, if I have a disability, you can't discriminate against me. It's the wrong answer. It's the wrong question. It's the wrong setup. But you see the correlation between how the attorneys do this. They, they work to subvert. They don't actually do the oper actual proper law. They don't s jump in and show the silences are going. They don't stop and say, wait a minute, you didn't state the whole law. They perpetually misstate the law. 
Here, the 252s, if you just, if your eyes are glazed back by the second paragraph and you don't realize the part 228, 252s were renumbered to 228 and 252 was the implementation of the rules for NEPA, which only applies to major federal actions, you missed the whole trick. I, I'm pausing. I, I don't know whether you're all following. I know it's kind of complicated in a way, and maybe I'd. I'm trying to lay this out as, as clearly as possible to show you the answers are in the black and white if we would just go there and enforce them instead of waiting on someone else's opinion or one who comes as a, in a costume of some protector of your rights. Now, how is this handled? And the question right now is, do we even respond to this fraudulent notice? There's a, there's a part of me that says we need to at least in the minimum call it out, at least to verify, confirm maybe that we have standing to do so in the future when this thing goes south on this rule. Trying to stand on the precedent of essentially of this court case. It's all wrong. It's all interpreted wrong. The courts come at you and say that this is the law and it's absolutely not the law. It's how they're getting away around the property rights is the most important point for you to understand. How they're getting away from their obligations and duties. How you're seeing that there's no accountability at this point to it. And how easy is this to all avoid? was to simply write a letter in the beginning when they were when a demand was made for the plan of operations under part 228 for purposes of a major federal action to say that's not me I don't do that thank you very much go away am I just talking out out my just talking the, the in the breeze no we do this all the time I've talked to you about the 3809s this rule change is trying to conform the 228s to the 3809s now, if you remember, the 3809s are the regulations implementing what? Well, they'll tell you in the purpose and the scope, it's relevant on the BLM side, the Secretary of Interior side, four, I think it's four different special lands over which this applies. None of which most miners are involved in. None. And then, But there's another thing. So if if the BLM and the Forest Service have different authorities because the Forest Service is now over these forest reserves and the BLM is all in the public lands that are not reserved, that are still open for appropriations, what about the 3809s is consistent and needs to be brought into conformity over the territory of the forest reserve? Can't even be discussed. It's not the same. So it's not that provision in the rule. So what is it? We go reading down through the regulations of 3809, and I've talked about this, made whole broadcast about it. We get down to the provision D, and it talks to what? It talks to NEPA. The only two things that, are, that need to be brought together are the implementation of the rule for the purpose of NEPA, which for both agencies is a requirement, but only for what? For you or for them? For them. And upon what subject matter? Upon the subject matter of a major federal uh, project demonstration or whatever they want to call those things I give all kinds of names to them within which you are if you have a contract inside those projects you are the operator remember the court case talked about operator they didn't talk grantee they talked about operator all consistent in the application they're consistent in the application they're not consistent in how they tell you they have the authority because they have none they obfuscated in the silence. The crickets against you are the ones that are, it's their, It's how they defeat you. It's why I think you say you can't be your own cricket. The rule is bringing, this is admission. I've been telling you, I've been saying this to the miners since 2005 when I started talking to them all. I said this, this, uh, this plan of operations and bonding and all this other stuff has to do with something else has to do with this NEPA, has to do when you're into a, a contract with the government and they're investing into some kind of a, a development or improvement. What you're doing when you take out the minerals is not an improvement either. So that was another word that popped up. That when you come directly at this and say, you know, you can't, you've, asked, you've demanded the plan of operations, but that's only relevant to the major major federal uh, project and uh, of which I am not and my work is not my work my work remember you got work granted work inside the mineral grant is not within your jurisdiction that letter usually ends it I say usually because sometimes there's a second letter and we go after them by an, in, the imposition of a felony of the felonies because now they're coming under a color of authority where they have no right and they've been now intended it after you've told them 
they have no authority. And so Flip, this FLIPMA directs us to consolidate these two agencies. Back in 1976, they've been starting to do that. They want to conform the 228s with the 3809s, the only consistency of which is the NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. And that's what they're trying to do, making it consistent across the board. So there's a not so duplicate, much duplication or incorrect action or un misunderstanding. For me, that's much easier. I can now say, okay, 228s are now the 3809s, and the only thing we need to look at is whether or not we're part of NEPA. And we aren't as people, men and women just doing entries in the mineral estate or your agriculture or your use of the highways, which are the statutorily accepted things. Those are outside of this agency regulation. These are specific uses. They're already dead determined. They're disposed. Not special uses. FLIPMA recognizes specific uses at uh, 17, oh, 43 U.S.C. 1701 sub 3. It says it right there. And then there's two other ones down the road. And we'll get too lost in all those. It's all written, I guess, is the bottom line point on this as well. But there's a fraud in the notice for us for comment. We're now discussing, it all of a sudden flared up. I wasn't going to, like I said, talk about this. But it's flared up. I wanted you to hear when the t case came out and this rule change happened and they all were consistent in how they're just, how they're, um, misinterpreting or fraudulently interpreting, in other words, they're intending to misinterpret and misdiagnose, misstate this to assume an authority that doesn't exist. When those two cases, when the case and the rule were consistent coming out in the same, essentially the same time, uh, this we've seen this before quite a few years ago. And so this is going to be another push. But the miners, again, are self-inflicted wounds. They're doing it to themselves. They went in on a question that doesn't, there is no question. They made a question. And they're going to get asked the wrong question. They're going to ask a question at all. Then it's going to be the wrong question. And they ask through somebody else. And they're going to get the right answer to all that. And when you ask someone for your, your rights and your property of someone else, they're going to tell you no, most likely. In particular, the Bar Association, we got on record why they're going to do that. So how you ask, you answer to me how, if the given that Part 228s are applicable uh, to the regulation authority that the court case says, which is the truth. This is like the, they tell the truth, but they don't tell you the whole truth. It is applicable, given what? When you go read NEPA, given what is a major federal action? If you're not a federal ac action, the question is, is it applicable? You would have to say no, and it's not. So if you don't have the question, then why would you make the question? And then when you went in, you may convoluted the question, so you get the right answer, which is to take your pro someone's property, you, now you get the word where what an attorney, a torner is. It goes before the authority and it twists things so that you kind of lose, you just lose in the twisting of what's going on. The, the, con the lack of consistency and accuracy in replicating the context of these laws. On the rule side, they're going to now conform the rule from the Forest Service with the BLM side or the Secretary of Interior and it's all about NEPA. we got a clear answer now. It's just what I've been telling you all this time. This is how the code enforcement works in your local uh, local jurisdictions as well. You don't understand you have set laws sitting in the, there's set things sitting preserving these cases, and they're, they're only in very short words like subject to the vested rights, or you're prohibited unless, unless you acknowledge the, the prior right. That's where you have to step in. You can't be a cricket. That's, that's what that means. So I wanted to point out this Miners have read, read, read uh, are getting this court, court case. Uh, I, I, I don't give much credit to any of it. I've told you early, just in the beginning of the broadcast, how this is just invalid. It won't look invalid. It looks like it's, it's, it's a color of law of felony is what it ends up being. There's no real authority in it. It was uh, given to the miners because the miner was, Ill, was wrongly, criminally advised to fill out a plan of operations that's not applicable to, to him. And on that question, invoking a state authority now, because that's what that does, you have to be in compliance with all environmental regulations. Now you, now you are subject. Now, if you're subject because of what you filed, how, what is your argument in contention of the law for the environmental protection? How are you, how are you, why do you think you have a right to argue? When you said, I have to take that on, I'm going to do it by filing this, this piece of paper because this attorney told me so. 
Oh, and by chance, that attorney's going to help defend me when I go argue, when now I have to argue against the imposition. And I'm going to gather a bunch of other people who don't read uh, up on this stuff, and I'm going to make a bigger, bigger mass of a gang, and we're going to go show up in the court, and we're going to all try to argue that something we agreed to can't be held against us. And the black and white clearly shows it's not applicable. Let me offer to you, this is no different, the same answer as the sugar pine mine issue. Remember, when they now have a com public comment on a background that they tell you they want to conform the 3809s with the 228s, you know that the 3809 that was not responded to properly by the sugar pine mine people is the NEPA application, application that's improper. Had they responded, and I told you this before, this is not something after the fact, I've told you this a long time ago, had they properly responded like I suggest that we've, well, I've done, we, I've done it, lots of the miners do it when they know they apply to this whole concept of it's not applicable and you line out how these certain sentences, the, the, the issue goes away. The, this case that just came out for the Forest Service side, now you see the rule wants to make consistent the 38 with the con, confirm um, consistency with the 3809s is the sugar pine mine problem. And it was all done because people believe that they're subject to these regulations, and yet there's no regulation out there when you go read them that says that there is. In fact, if you look carefully, you'll see now, in seven, since 76, the savings clauses are throughout. You see it at 1701.3. That's right up in the beginning of the, of the uh, Federal uh, Land Management Policy Act. Then you see it again at 1732, clearly. There's four sections. Each has a savings clause against interfering with this grant. So at that point, when an agency comes at you, and this is a co even code enforcement, they come at you, you have to analyze what authority do they have to subvert the underlying rights? And you speak in the term of vested rights that they now you put on them to show how they have the authority to interfere. Otherwise, they're explaining that they have no authority at all. And, and so, it's the same method over and over. So this provides us, a, I think, a quick way, I hope. I know it took an hour here, but the courts will tell you wrong. There's a reason why that is. I read it in, our, in the Bar Association documents. They do it in a certain way, which is identifiable. I typed in one one chapter, I mean, a section of law, and it's in the it's in the the opinion. Uh, to the page tells me that was the page told me just knowing this method of destruction told me what I was going to be finding, and it was there. Was more important. I could predict it's going to be there, and there it was. In other words, I said I haven't read the case. I just went to where the problem's going to be. I typed in the imposition of 228 on a grantee. The underlying case is an attorney told the guy to fill out a plan of operations, which you hear is required in the court case. For what? For the implementation of Part 228, which is for what? For making plans of operations in, in executing upon a major federal project. Are you a operator underneath a major federal project? If you're not, why are you applying that part of the law? Why is this court presuming them to be this status? Is also found in the case, and it is applicable to common minerals, but not the uncommon, not the grantees. Notwithstanding what the Forest Service will say on this public notice here, that the locatable mineral mining can be regulated, it actually can't. This has been part of the big, the big obfuscation. Yeah, I guess it could underneath NEPA, but see, that might be a breach. My thought is that's a breach as well because the impact to man's environment includes his grants. You can't throw a major project over a, a known mineral, a mineral, known uncommon mineral deposit. That's a breach by the grantee, the grantor. And so this, the, when you start putting in the hierarchies, you start understanding property, and you understand it more fully than what they're told, they tell, how they tell us we're supposed to know. And you start applying the basic nuts and bolts on the black and white we're told. We don't see the world that we've been told exists by their, by their rule. 
And as long as people don't do this, I'm going to see, I guess, uh, I'll be seeing a lot of this nonsense that goes on, all these myths and utopias being spoken to. All I just said in, in this hour or so would be resolved in 15 minutes citing three or four sections of the code to show that what the impo imposition is is not lawfully may imposed. It would take less time to actually write the letter than it does to explain it. And there's so much more to explain, and it all comes out to be the same analysis. It's not what the just, so-called justices are saying. It's not what the attorneys are saying. It's not even what the miners understand. And I tell you, the microcosm of the miner, in their misunderstanding, is the macrocosm of America, in their under misunderstanding. It's a fractal. It's the same problem part in the minuscule and then the minor gets to the major. In the minor, literally, but minor hits the major. It's the same defect. This plays out over and over, and it's exploited over and over. And it's done by things like we see this comment period. Now, let me get back to that. We're looking now, it came up in the last few days, uh, do we even respond to this as a mining district? Part of me doesn't even want to touch it, because I already know the answer to all this. It doesn't matter... If, if all this object is is to bring the 228s into conformity with the 3809s to kind of meld the two uh, federal agent, land, public land agencies together, which they've been trying to do slowly over time, then the answer to this is all the same. Why would we want to waste our time? And so the, I'm settled. I'm settled that that would be so, fine enough. However, I also know, I, you know, and I've told you to, work on worst case. Don't work on best case. Work on worst case so you have the battlefield understood enough to know that there could be a worst case and what that might be as best you can work it and then act through that. Tells me we should at least do the most basic response in order to out, at least in bullet point form, all the basic failures, failures to notice the public to properly respond to this and the failure in the failures to then allow them to misstate their authority might be a paper we can submit. And so I'm, I lay it out to you that way for those of you that are interested. I won't tell you what all those could be because uh, you can mess that up and that causes problem, problems too. Anybody that's really interested can contact me always. You know that. Anybody that has knows that. I get to you as fast as I can and try to, as completely as I understand. Again, the uh, emails are kind of sometimes hard to understand uh, a bit for me and the chats, there's a lot missing, but I do my best. Uh, that's why it's best also it kind of tracks me and I just stay on the objective basis. I try to do analyses right through through what actually applies to, on some, for somebody on the ground. What are they going to find on the ground? Uh, it doesn't prove that that's what it is because I'm looking. It's like remote viewing in a way. Not the same way, but in, you understand it. I'm looking afar, attempting to correlate certain realities and facts that normally happen and then say, okay, this might apply to you. See if it... You do your surveillance and see if it's on the ground, if it's what you see on the ground. Any big differences, come back and tell me so that we can do some adjustment. But, but typically it's pretty accurate because all this is really pretty much the same. How was I able to know to look for the 228s in the decision to see that would defeat them and then go over and find this coincidence of the now 228 reforms that are coming? And they, all it is is con all they want to do with all this, however they're going to do it, is conform the, three, uh, the, the same uh, rule implementation of the same code which is not applicable. How did I know to go look for that? Because that's the method of destruction. The government of the attorneys know how to make give you the bait for something that doesn't exist, and you bite on the bait, and they got you. They hook you. And someone like me comes along, and they just discredit. Where's your... You're just discredited because they understand that they have a bunch of people that don't know how to think anymore and don't want to spend the basic time to go read, and they got you because they got, they got the authority. And all this, all of this seems to me, and it has been so far, all of this is handled just by going to the black and white and find the lack of authority or, more importantly, the betrayal to the, to the authority, which I see is evidenced in the lawsuit. And we knew, this is predictable, folks. I don't even know what to tell you how predictable this is. And we have counteractions that would have not brought this up to this level to be a court case. Says we got we got this understood pretty good, and yet it continues. And the evidence that this continues is the evidence of the failure of our of our people in our society. 
and I, again, it's in the black and white. I don't, I don't know what the big argument is. If, if I, here's the other thing. If I can show you, and I just did, this authority doesn't exist. They say that they say the authority exists to regulate. Then you go look at the regulations, and you realize that the pre the prevailing authority is this is these grants that they can't be interfered with. Then you realize that there is going to be a rule, but the rule's going to say it can't interfere. When they disregard the fact that it's not supposed to interfere, now you're looking at the plan takedown. That I can tell you to go look for that should give you an indication of the of its continued and continuing utility. That I when I also tell you that you stop that by putting the proper administrative record in, so they can't go judicial. And if you go judicial, you then have your collateral attack on them. If you don't see that, you don't understand how simple this really can be. You won't be looking within the context of your legal defenses, uh, criminal defenses, because it'll never happen. You won't necessarily even need, I don't even think you need to challenge a state authority. Why? Well, there's a state of our authority, and they're saying right now it's applicable, but what's it applicable through? It's applicable through the original filing of a plan of operations that was imposed by the 228 NEPA, which says you have to go look at that state regulation. If you never file the plan of operations because you're not a federal major federal action de demonstration or project, are you subject to those environmental rules? Well, obviously you wouldn't. There would be no direction to go look at them, would there? There's no nothing that the agency at the federal side has to look at now. Because they got no no jurisdiction over it. Isn't that exactly the same as when I've told you that the the statutory accepted roads and trails in your state on the federal uh, the um, the public land now public domain is can be monitored by the agencies, but they cannot be interfered with. That's identical. These places in hold the public land and a public domain reserved, but, but prior reservation to the mineral estate for the miners. And agriculture, don't forget. And water appropriations, don't forget. And then you go back to the mission of the Forest Service. It's pretty much strictly to... Uh, fight deprivation, uh, depredations of fire uh, and continue waters and uh, harvesting timber. What the heck? That's it? Yeah, that's it. They're not supposed to interfere with any of this stuff. They're not supposed to firebomb uh, places like, like we've seen. They firebombed our, our claim. Well, we, we put in a notice about it. We don't know what's going to happen yet. They, they're not there to stop this stuff. They're there to, in, to impose incorrectly. And they're there to, and I want to point out this court case proves the, the, the black-robed bar members will continue the fraud against the people. The initial entry agent is the attorney that will not actually look at what's supposed to be said and, and the, uh, stop uh, and the savings clauses that would prohibit the motion before you got into a, an, a judicial problem. This And this execution on this to stop this is universally the same. When you do this, you're not having to look for any court procedures because you never really get there unless it's you moving against them for being the felons that they are. And you've got the record to do it. How, how are they going to come against you when you showed in the record uh, that they had no authority in three or four different places? That the actual law states this, but they fraudulently, then you make this comment, the law states this, but their position is this, and that's a fraud. And they do that in order to take your property. That's a felony. How hard is that to say? So for, for people that are interested in this and the rule, they're going to make a rule change on 228s. You can read into that. I'm not sure yet what I, I really feel about what the response is. I, I do want to hesitate. I probably hesitate in the direction of making a minimal comment outlining a bullet point presentation of the, of the failures which make it appear they have an authority, and the failure to, to state that 252s was the rules for the rules implementing the National Environment Policy Act. That omission alone is a fraud on everybody. When you understand it's the any NEPA, and then you go look at what they're pertaining to, and they didn't say that, that's a fraudulent, a material fraudulent by omission when they're now claiming they can come and regulate something they have no right to regulate because it was reserved from their authority as I read the Organic Act. 
the rules and regulations that they're talking about are actually the ones that for your location, that's under state law. And now you've got to get back into knowledge of that when it disposes, the land, any land disposes, it transfers authority into state provisions of the guidance. In other words, for a miner, when you go to locate your claim, you do it by the rules of the state. Remember, the, 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 the clerk, the county clerks, are the ex officio deputy mining district recorders. They're, they took on a part of the mining did. They're still alive in the state. They have to take this on. This is all alive, right in front of our face, if we were just look at it. This stuff is alive in the land. The law of the land is alive. It's, it's about produ producing from the life. At any rate, so we'll move on. When you look at this in my mind clearly, you have a way to address it. If you think you make this stuff up, you have no way to address it. If you rely on other people, you're going to lose. It's just absolutely the way it works. When you take it in on your own responsibilities, I tell you, you've got to take the responsibility here behind the woodshed. And you just read the proper places to read, you see. Well, where are the proper places? Well, okay, the, that is a bigger question. I'm here to explain it. Like you go read here, 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 here. I just, I just gave you four, doc, four, five places to go read. You could read all that I just read off in the context that I did it and point out all these things. I did it, it took an, over an hour just to explain it, but it took a few minutes for me when I was pulling this together last night. I said, I better talk about this. I wasn't going to talk about it. I said, well, here's an object lesson how we get betrayed, how we're set up for the takedown, how it's so simply to, simple to avoid, what they're trying to do to actually confirm that they're doing all this together, and it still make the changes will still not change anything. It still will only be applicable to NEPA, and everybody who has a right to ingress and egress the public domain, uh, on the public domain in the public lands, or in holders, are not to be interfered with, is in the black and white. Why can't those of you that have no intention to go there not see that in your state on the so-called state lands, that your private properties that were disposed and your highways that were disposed and the water disposed to you are the same rights? I don't understand. But that's up to you all to disregard and, and whine about, I suppose, because once you see this, it's not, there's nothing more to do than to out and arrest the, the one who's coming to thieve it from you. So I, I guess... So much to talk about, but I don't think I want to go any further. I think I've just summarized what I was uh, wanting to point out. We've got a court case where the the, the so-called justices betray the law. They con they construct it in a way that uh, that is not proper in its actual application, and they do so by not mentioning certain things like these savings provisions. Uh, clearly, there's no ingress and egress uh, implications. Uh, when you have a, sta a rule that says there's no. Uh, also, they don't talk about the 551 was to implement 4, 471. 471 was repealed. 471 was talking about your ingress and egress rights uh, as regulation. They took those out. They took those out in preface of the, of the FLIPMA. It all happened at the same time. But that didn't get rid of your preserved or vested rights of ingress and egress on roads and trails. Right? Because those are preserved in 1732 if we needed to see it in print. And it's also preserved in 1701 sub 3 where specific uses are not underneath that that management act. It says it right there, folks, if you just go look. Do the judges and the attorneys look at that? Absolutely they do not. Do most people that don't understand? Well, they don't even know. I mean, they're, we're all clueless that way. Do those of us that speak in this way, that present that, that just want to get the law and accountability back to the law, uh, do we get regarded uh, very highly? No. And that's because mostly everyone's ignorant of the whole fact. And as long as you allow these uh, the questions to be determined by those that have told you they're going to steal your rights, the Bar Association's House Delegates Rules, uh, Rules Memorandum uh, declares they're going to do that. And they're going to do it by a certain method. They tell you all about this stuff. Why would you want them as an agency that they've subverted a whole judicial branch? It is beyond me. And so at this time, when I'm all by myself, I have a handful of guys that we all see this. We're all doing what we can to fight back, and we do what we can to keep people uh, from being run down by this. We can't change that whole system, but we can sure out it, and we then learn, do not engage it. And we do not engage it by saying, well, it says right here you don't have a right to engage us. 
You're a trespasser on us. You're doing it under a color authority, and I've learned now, if we go back to the statutes, the same black and white everyone wants to kind of run away from and not really read, even though it says it in sentences what your rights are. When they do that, that's a felony. And once you get a federal officer in felony under state law, you got him. Uh, he doesn't have a color that they can. There's no scope of his of his offered scope of his job that he can cover by. And so you develop another angle. Okay, I'm pausing. Oh, I don't know if I keep talking, keep talking. I want to say more. I don't want to say more. It's all right here for us, folks. It's all I talk about. Here, here in a, in a so-called judicial decision, of it's an incompetent court, incompetently presented, incompetently, the justices were making, I think it was a joke. I don't know why the word dredging was even used in the context of that case, but it was. And so one justice said, he used the word uh, sludging. That's what it was. Well, in fact, in some regard, that's what the a dredger does. See, a, dredger, a dredger does have sludge, right? They make sludge because they're opening a navigation channel. It's not what miners do. So in a way, is, uh, is that justice laughing at these people? Or is he just truly incompetent in the terminology because he also should have the obligation to say, well, you're not talking dredging here because that's irrelevant to the subject matter. The Harbors, and, uh, Harbors uh, Act is irrelevant, 1899, is irrelevant to the grant, is what that judge, a, a judge of law, justice under law, should have said. That would have actually showed me dredging, sludging. No, but this is all part of a law that you guys presented a law that doesn't exist for you. And I'm going to, de I'm going to deny that and say that was improperly applied upon you was the proper answer here. No, they play the game with the terms or they show their ignorance of the subject matter. Now, do you, if it's ignorance of the subject matter and these calling themselves a judge, a justice, how can you trust that? And if you don't know the language... How do you know not to trust it? Is a uh, fascination to me. You all complain about stuff, but you don't understand how to identify when these people are just absolute buffoons. Or they're evil. And you're going to have to know how how to treat deal with either one. To me, it's deal with the same thing. It's all evil when it diminishes you. And so I get to go. I get to narrow my my focus. The real simple is you want to talk about authority and authority. How how do you what's the, the standard you use to justify it? Your opinion, or would you rather just go to the black and white that says so? And then there's no no question, no issue, nothing to make a question that someone can cause a problem for you. About. This is this this is the war that we're in. When you walk into the courts, it's a war. It's the surrogate for civil war. It's the adversarial system. It's been modified now to be courts of, from courts of justice to courts of resolution in the adversarial dispute resolution context. So when you walk into the court in their equity side and you said, well, I agreed to these standards, but I don't agree to the extent that they applied, it's likely you're going to lose. Instead of not doing it at all and not being there, or once you found out it was wrong to go into court and say, I was fraudulently uh, advised to file this, uh, I retract it, I re re uh, rescind my signature and re retract it, dismiss the case because it's a violation of the code, they have no authority to accept it, is a wholly different position. That's not a question. That's a whether or not the facts of, the, of that point and the rescission actually have force and effect relative to the the paper that you wrongly filed. You can make a mistake and rescind that. That's part of the rescission. You want to do the UCC, there it is. Rescission of signature. I've talked about all this stuff, folks. It's not so cut and dried when you have always have a remedy to do justice, and that's in your hands. You can make a mistake. There's about five different reasons how that is accepted. To rescind the signature on a plan, on a rule, on, a, on an application for something, you pull that back and you say, because of this mistake, this, this caused this ramifications, I'm putting on notice to fix that problem uh, undo that condition from before the time I filled that paperwork out and then watch whether or not they do. And if they don't, then you're look, looking at being a prisoner to someone who has no authority. I think it's a whole lot better condition than to get yourself into, oh, I filed this plan of operation, but I didn't like how, how much environmental policies I had to follow now. And completely oblivious to the fact that none of that was applicable anyway. And that's not my opinion. We just, again, NEPA 
uh, the 228s uh, implement NEPA. NEPA is relative, and I'm just taking the short course here, folks. There's all kinds of stuff I can go through NEPA. NEPA is the National Environment Policy Act, which the agencies have to do. They're the ones that have to file the plans. And I would say they're the ones that have to file the bonds when it looks like they're supposed to, they might interfere with inholders. And this gets us to fire and the fire damage, too, which is not happening at the local level. Remember, the ultimate control of the fires is in the local jurisdiction. How is it not like that in all subject matter areas where the federal government's merely in a proprietary interest only status? Should be a fascination to you that we got this far screwed up. Remember that too. See, this is all the stuff that sits there. I could go on and on and on about it. It's all laying out every authority that there would be on how this is not supposed to be the way it is, and yet we're witnessing people being harmed by it. Is the war against you? Is the war against us all? The microcosm of this case is the macrocosm that the world suffers under. And I think part of it is us being clueless as to our own responsibility and our own selves and, and, the, and the apathy or whatever, the fear from taking of taking responsibility. And that necessarily means you have to stand up a bit. Huh? you got to stand up and plant your flag, I guess. you got to draw your line in the, in the dirt, in the rock. you got to dry, chip it in the rock. I wouldn't do it in sand. The next wind will blow away. Right, the next next flood washes the sand away, but the rock, I'm not so sure. Put it in the foundation of the law of the land, and then defend every encroachment of that. And when you put in the law of the land, you find all these exceptions sitting in the rule that the court says you have to follow. Why didn't the court explain the exceptions sitting in the rule? Unless they intend to hurt you, and therefore you can't. They're not reliable. You, you're, you, we should have a vo- one voice we can't trust, and have that be out there, even though it doesn't sound like it's listened to. Believe me, it'll be powerful. We have one voice. It's not trusting. We don't trust this at all. There's fiduciary breaches left and right, and we're going to stop it by not trusting, and we're going to do it our way. We're going to do it in the way of the black and white for the time being, and also because we need guidance because we're not capable. We're messed up. And uh, and the war against us uses these exploitations. Again, the courts are... Courts of adversarial, they're the, they're the transplant of the Civil War that never was ended. Shocking, isn't it? Oh, but there was a proclamation. No, there wasn't. There wasn't actually. And I did notice, and pretty interesting, I may get to it here, there was a, you know, maybe Jackson made a declaration, but you look very, a proclamation. It purports to limit, to end the, the war. And it, but you look very carefully, it did no such thing. It's the same obfuscation that we see going on in lots of other places. You start to learn to look for it. You look for when they were supposed to say something and they didn't, you put that in a category. Okay, let's go look for the other ones they're not going to mention correctly, which would alter what they're saying in even that moment. Had they stated what was clearly in the black and white to say and they didn't, and pulling it out changes literally 180 degrees the determination, you realize you're, you're working with a con artist or a complete incompetent. And I don't mean just incompetence in law. I'm talking about just completely gone. I mean, just not capable. And it doesn't take genius to figure this out. It's all written. Again, I'm saying go to the writing. Go to understand what it's telling you and put force and effect to it. When it says that nothing shall in this delegation of authority under the Forest Service for making rules shall interfere with the general mining law of the United States or the Wilderness Act, take that to the bank. Okay? I mean, it's not that hard. So this war comes about, I've been talking about war, the military consequence, and thank you very much to uh, someone who wrote three comments on the Jeff- oh, excuse me, Real Liberty Media website in the comment section. And thank you again to all you all folks that do whatever you share, your mirrors, all that stuff. With all this censorship going on, uh, we really, I really need the support, I suppose, given that there's any to have, the people that understand what's, what's going on and need the information. Uh, please uh, disseminate this information out there. But I did get a comment directly on the Real Liberty Media website, reallibertymedia.com, Media, Real uh, from a Joyce. And it talks about, asks the questions, very important questions, but uh, we'll see whether or not we can come up with an answer at this point. And it's a very pointed question. I talk about the military consequence, and you don't want to then say, well, what do we do about it? Well, she, Joyce asked that. What do we do about the military controllers? Second question, two minutes later, what do we do about the controllers of the military? 
Two minutes later, another question. What do we do about the treasonous people controlling our military? Very important questions. Again, this has been the silent thing that I'm bringing, I have not uh, tackled at all because, partly because I don't have that answer actually. I can tell you that we can, we know them when we see them. But the populace, as I brought up, as we're talked about, Jeff, was it Thomas Jefferson said, it's the educated masses that are vigilant to stop this are what required to stop it. One or two of us may not be able to do that, and that makes a little bit of sense as I say that with a smile, a slight smile on my face. How is any one or two of us going to? Uh, this is a comprehensive attack. Also, there's multiple dimensions and layers. These questions are not um, inconsequential. I'm not sure I can answer them, but I can give us a direction. As I keep telling you, I can put, a, put us on a path. Are we, are we willing to take it? Are we going to find maybe the path that looks like today needs to be altered a bit? We maybe have to have to go to a different path. I don't know. But until we get on that journey, I don't know that we can alter this because the, there's a plan afoot and it's gotten us to where we have to ask the question. What do we do about military controllers? Well, I don't know. If I was looking at the reality of it, I can't do anything. Joyce, you can't do anything. What we can do is start to educate and to take the action we can take. As I was talking all this last broadcast, this an hour and a half, how do you subvert the overarching control that is this, this uh, civil war placed in our courts and mimicking this war between each one of us? You talk about a divided system. Is a part way to attack the military controllers. Because once, see, even the military, if you look at the Lieber Code, even the military has some consequence, and it's only the most heinous war criminal that you're, you're, you're going to be looking at there. And so we, we could limit, eliminate quite a few people that we'd have to worry about to be a threat if we just imposed, again, the thing that the occupier can't, can't interfere with if they're honorable. And you, again, if anybody don't care, I don't know what to do. But that's why you need a whole bunch of people to help. Because when you got someone that don't care, that, that's just like a, well, just a murderer, a killer. It's just a, a destroyer. Whatever the reason, I have psychopathy, you know, sociopathy, it doesn't matter. You just have someone that's going to kill you. Uh, and so short of that honor, or short of the uh, embarrassment of being exposed or the, exposi uh, the exposition of the military controller, is what we start to hit on. I can't answer how you control the military controls. In a military consequence, you have to destroy them. That's the problem of the international law. You're an occupied people. You have two decisions. You either give in and be conquested or you overthrow them. How? Boy, we have to have a whole lot of people together to have much better, clearer thought than uh, just my little place uh, than observations behind the woodshed. I've got some interesting, uh, not interesting, i got some uh, ideas, uh, but it would be more in the context of we peacefully move back through and we regain the, all the territory and all the land and all the rights that they've been uh, obfuscating and betraying us upon. We have some work for us to do. You want to stop a military controller? Understand yourself. Stop being subject to your own frailties, as we would see here the uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Next question, How do we? Uh, what do we do about the controllers of the military? Well, the controllers of the military, where do we go? Well, indirectly, we can talk about, let's say, the the Bar Association. There are documents that say that they're an occupying force on our soil. They tell you that when you go to the proper states that have acknowledged this, they've substituted your laws. Those are, those are occupiers. The Bar Association did that as one of the many possible occupations on our lives. So we have to split our, ga our, our, our numbers up and look at how what part of this do we attack. Who's controlling the controllers? Remember, the, the military would have a spaghetti western front that to get everyone to believe in. Oh, this court of justice is a court of justice, and you go bow to the, to the court of justice, and it's nothing but a betrayal. Is what they want. There's a military, con, military behind that, but who controls the, control, the military? I don't know if I can even answer that. This is where it gets really, really deep. We may even transcend physicality in this answer. And I don't want to get too weird with that, but it sits there as, an, again, a possibility and a category. All I know is we have local action to take. That's within us. We have a local acknowledgement of our responsibilities and accepting those, or we don't. And if we don't, we're gone. 
We can't do anything. We can't control ourselves and take responsibility. Why the question? I say start something local to you that is of interest. Find the wrong you need to make right and stay inside the context of the construction they have. Admit it's there. Give it due authority and work within it to show that it doesn't have any power and force over you. I just did that for the last hour and a half over some totally esoteric to most people condition of the mining law, but it has to do with property law, has to do with your highways, has to do with your water, has to do with the the, um, inholding idea, the fact of the all-powerful sovereign war criminal called the United States government has no power, actually. But it can use its instrumentalities in order to make you believe it does. This is, a, this is a perception thing in us, not outside. We each start solving this, and all of a sudden we start throwing off that, that conse- the military consequence. And if we throw it off, then the controllers to that are powerless. I don't have to know who they are. I tr- as, I was, well, as I was in a conversation recently, months ago here, where, when you really work out what your, your true innocence is, it becomes pretty powerful. I don't take. I have no guilt about what what is all this is about. I just realize I've got this major, major affront to to whatever. I mean, just to be free from it and live without harm, intending harm, and I'm still got someone against me is a is a pretty big evil. I think most of us are are like that. That I don't know if I can address that directly, but I can see the effect of that thing, and if I can address those things, I can stop it. Again, the consequence of the rule imposition where you find out that there's no rule that can be imposed, even though that you have to follow the rules, but that there can be no rule involved, I eliminate that evil altogether. I don't have to worry about who controls the mil- that military control, because it is a military control when they're imposing this betrayal upon you. It's not in the law. Otherwise, they would properly state it. And that's our guide. It's not about like the law is our, is our shield. It's our way to measure and weight the damage, weight the harm, weight the attack. We weigh it, and we measure it. And so these are tools for us, I guess. And getting, what do you do about the treasonous people controlling our military? Well, it kind of relates to the controllers. If I get rid of the effect of the, of the control by showing it can't control me, it doesn't matter who's controlling them, I guess, is, is part of the thing. What do you do about it? If you actually have someone in your hands, we, we, that's just the accountability problem. We definitely need accountability. I myself and Joyce, you commenting, looking at this problem. How do we do this? On our own, I'm not so sure. On our own, we cause that. But we get to be the witnesses and we become the force and example of of, of attempting to reattain that. You're not going to do this by going to a court and getting a bad decision of manipulators and attorneys and twisters and turners. You're going to do it by stepping back and saying, well, you're wrongly imposing upon me and I'm going to make that record up front. If I vanquish you there, I've got no more things to well worry about until you kind of sneak up on me later. But more of us that are doing this they're not going to sneak up so fast. And they don't. More, when they know who you the gang you're in and you're more formidable, they realize to stay away. This happens with the Jefferson Mining District and the new the new placards and stuff. The, 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 uh, some of the agents, the stories we're getting about the interaction with the agencies is really, they're backed off. Uh, one of our guys went up on the mountain uh, to, into the claim, had the had the things. They were just waved right on through, no stopping like the time before. There's there's something going on. How you stop the military National Guard guy who week before was stopping and trying to throw people back out, let waves you back on without talking to him. That's how you stop it. You start sitting inside the law, the black and white. I keep saying properly applied. Those treasonous bastages that are in there, we just have to start enforcing accountability and throwing out anybody who won't and making sure. That's local too. I don't know how to do that. I just know it has to be done. I got some ideas about how you begin. Okay, so I don't know if I've answered all your questions. I don't have an answer for controlling a military power. I'm not I'm not oriented that way. I do know they exist. I do know they const- all they do is destroy. I also know that if we engage that, we gave, give some legitimacy to it, uh, and when we may be able to be more intelligent than to do so in a gr- guerrilla tactic, the monkeys that we is, in a better strategy and tactic to outmaneuver them. We're much faster in outmaneuvering them. And we can do it by throwing up constraints, and the only re- limitation on that is the amount of people that will witness the war criminal becoming... Uh, 
wanting to violate that. And right now we just don't have the numbers. And so controlling the action of the military being controlled by the controllers controls the, the controllers. It's not going to get rid of their evil intent. I don't know if you can do that. That's now we're getting into the esoteric past. I don't know if, again, Cain Cain killed Abel. I don't know what else you do. Brother kills a brother. What else do you do? Your family member kills you. We're on some shaky ground to start with. And so that's in us. And that's that's not okay, but it's, I mean, that's, that's, that's acceptable to the extent that it's there. I don't know what else. That's an authority I can't change. I know that's going to be a possibility. I better make provision for it. So, how do you start do the military? You don't allow them to control. You don't let the spaghetti western confound you. You don't let the front of that that's keeping this so-called, if it is a secret, to me it's not a secret, but to keep this secret that it's under this type of control, don't even engage it. Just just show where there's a limit to the extension. They have to work through an objective basis. If they don't have an objective basis, it's understood universally. That's the war crime. And those are more easily outed. But in today's social media, be careful, because that's not even an answer as well. There's nothing obvious. Like, like what they say, common what, common sense is not so common. Well, the common is the vulgar. You better have your own sense, and it better be based in some foundation. And I think in war, there's no guarantee you'll li- live, but you can understand the battlefield and whom you might be up against, and that will determine a more proper action. Sometimes it's an inaction. Sometimes it's a retreat with a removing. But like I was saying, we're looking at a rule that's coming through. Do we even respond? Do we have to even engage that? Maybe it's best just to let that one go. Let them fall. Let them do what they're going to do. Let them do all the lies they're going to do. Because I know it doesn't matter. We can kill it by saying it's not applicable. Maybe our, our maybe our our attack, or maybe our addressments, maybe our uh, what we do. Where we go and what we spend our time in is better spent somewhere else. And we let we let them foment that little thing for themselves, for all that will be ignorant and clueless enough to participate in it. So in that regard, I don't know really have an answer. There's always going to be the question, the choice. Do you, do you address something or do you back off? Or do you let it fester? Do you let it kind of go and, and then just de- know you can deal with it later? Or do you let it go and, and then hope you can deal with it later? Do you try to... Do you think that you have the ammunition to, to kill it now? Well, I don't know. I don't, I'm not in that mindset. I don't know that, again, being that there's no accountability, there's no, no proper direct response yet that would help any one of us work this out. I can just tell you how to avoid a lot of things at this point while we learn better and better to confine this evil on us down into it. It's, it's really, it's a little bitty box it actually sits in. When we do this resolution versus justice of courts, you do resolution through con, uh, commerce, um, excuse me, consensus through dispute resolution, that's all non-constitutional. You identify that, you stick, that's a little bitty box that doesn't even belong in your country. And yet it, it, it's our courts today. And that's the tool of the occupier. I frame it in a military consequence because I haven't seen the military rule ended since the Civil War. I haven't seen the military rule ended in the world. In fact, the United States government that didn't end the Civil War now turned the Civil War on the world. As far as I see. How do we know that? You say, well, this guy's kind of gone nuts. How do we know that? The, the murder memo of 2010, it destroyed judicial determinations and they said, we're going to use a judici- uh, executive expedience. That's how I know. I didn't say it. They did. We're going to get rid of the Libra Code. We're not going to acknowledge international law. That's not my opinion. Is what the, I'm, I'm accepting what this power in the world says. They didn't end the Civil War, actually, and they turned the Civil War on the world. And they made your courts adversarial conditions and made their agents part of the decision-making power. And because there is international law working, because it has to do with not, you don't want to in, in, insult the natives in mass. You want to keep them divided. But you, you insult them in a cultural sense or in something where they deeply hold it all together. There's something inside. They all hold notwithstanding their division. And you insult that, the occupier has no chance. And so I've been hoping beyond hope, I point out this land law, 
point out these objective agents, point out that the occupier of the bar has no actual control, its agents have no control, the United States government has no control, and let's start pounding on, on those things, and we'll give ourselves the example, and we start educating ourselves better, and we get, the, we get the action underneath us, the trained action on how to deal with an oppressor and an occupier over time. We don't call ourselves out like a, you know, like a bull in a china closet. We don't we don't put a red flag out in a battlefield and, and threaten them and threat and accept ask them to shoot us. They will. No, we we stop the military by bringing to bear this this constraint that's acknowledged inside the Libra Code itself, even though the United States occupier of the world now has denounced that it still exists in a reality of people's most. Uh, deeply held identity. And once everybody stops this nonsense on the surface and pulls in with that identity, I think things things will start to go a lot better. We actually give we give force and effect to having different opinions and acting together, notwithstanding those opinions. But because there's an underlying value that we're all going to lose. Once we find that, or we find a mechanism to go find that. I think things start to, we get to the wider mass and the wider mass and the wider mass, and it becomes the, this deeply held acceptance that will not accept any further the occupation that we're living in. Which I, I tend to r- relate to military because wherever I go to find the authorities of the so-called license that it gives itself, it's all in a military context. Whether it's the failure to end the uh, civil war, uh, whether it's the statement that appears that it purports to but doesn't, whether it's in Title 50 that talks specifically about the war attack on everybody by giving exceptions to and through all kinds of uh, mil- actions, be it, be it pharmaceutical, chemical, biological, radiological, whatever, on and on. The government gives it to test against you, atomic. All this stuff was given, li- they give themselves license. You look at all these things, these are really tools of a military. The reference to the to the Libra Code and the denunciation of it says that as well. The reference to the civilian, and you think it's you and not the attorney that it really is, is another identification. And so we have all these, these tools that we can, or these words that we can look at and listen for that I don't really call out. I just say, oh, they went there. They're over. They're in this capacity. They're come. They're coming at us in this capacity. I keep that in my back pocket, and then I just start addressing that. How do I address it? I have to go find as quickly as I can the objective black and white that shows that they didn't have a right to go there. They either did it out of ignorance, which is no excuse, or they did it intentionally, which is a felony. And you give them the opportunity, one opportunity to back off. And so we don't, I don't know about controlling this military thing. I really don't. Uh, I don't know that any one of us can. We can for ourselves to the extent of the uh, evil in the one that uh, you're up against, a military officer in the form of a cop. As you know, we can be executed on the streets now. I, I told you all this was coming, and it's really sad to watch it. But anyway, there it is. So thank you for the questions and the in the comment. I, I usually don't respond too much to these, but this was an important. I do avoid talking to it, but I don't know if I have the answer. I have uh, some suggestions on how we are to to to, uh, to approach it, and one of them is approaching ourselves. We need to look in, inside of ourselves and stop making excuses for all the things that we just accept. And uh, I'm trying to give you the tools like today to show you it's all in, it's all in the black and white that the occupier even makes. Understand that. that that's there to protect us. It's, it's there to use, as the, I say, the word in your mouth to say, you know, you can't go that far. And if each one of us is saying, oh, no, you can't go that far and could hold it, and we all witness the, the if there if there is at that point, if there is at that point a non-accountability, we all insist on accountability. There's a number of mechanisms on that, and and so that, I guess I'll I'll say that that's enough there. I hope I answered some of your questions. I hope I don't disappoint that I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer for all this. It's just a matter of finding it out and having to live through it and doing my doing the best as I see to counter it all. What I counter it all is my my inter interaction with it as it comes before me, and I I am of the I'm convicted, if I go that far, that I think every, when everyone does this, it, we do things different. Things start to happen different. Again, what's the distinction? You become a sugar pine mine. You become this this case that now gets the, the, they mistreat everybody. 
or you become the miners that are never underneath that you never hear about that aren't underneath any of the regulation because they sent a simple letter that said you don't have authority to impose that. You don't have a right to make that question, that imposition, that uh, that demand. Look at the piece that goes on there. Yeah, I had to answer, but that was over. It's done. I go back to work, so to speak. I go back to what my life is as best as I can where there isn't another infringement coming. And again, the more of us stopping all these infringements, not trying to make an egoistic uh, uh, you know, example of it all, look what I've done. No, just stop the root of the harm. I think, again, I think cutting at the roots of the tree will more effectively kill the tree than slashing at the branches. But we have to do that, one of each of us, on what we understand, how we understand within our skill set because of the condition of a very well-played military operation, in my, in my uh, estimation. And so what's coming at us uh, with all some of this? So I'm going to move on uh, now less of the, the lessons learned and maybe trying to figure out how what we do about this. But what may be coming at us more in what is actually literally coming at us with this uh, control structure. You know, that's another obviousness that everyone kind of, uh, kind of blows away a little bit. The surveillance is a reason. It's because they were, didn't ever end the Civil War. And now they made war on the world, and now the whole world has to be under surveillance uh, and under the brand called the rule of law. How how universal is this oppression, and people don't really want to acknowledge it? No, no, they'll promote it. Now, I'm not talking rule of law when I'm writing my letter to say you don't have authority. I'm actually, I'm eliminating the rule of law by saying you never had a right to, to even talk about this. So I'm eliminating that enemy. I don't give them the air to breathe. And anybody that comes past that simple little discussion, we now have a felon uh, minimum, if not committing treason. Now we have the uh, problem of accountability. How do we hold those to account? That's all of us. I don't have that answer because I know what the answer is. You have a trial, and if they fail to answer why they've committed war on the laws of the United States as we see them through land disposal, they have to be dealt with harshly. I actually don't don't know about that part, but I mean that's that's the that's the penalty we're told on the notice, and that's not really happening either. You you'll be put to death for undermining the society that way. It's not a, just a banishment on this penalty, and we don't have that remedy at this point, or even coming close, even life in prison, whatever banish. We don't have that. Get these people out of here. You would see. Talk about a population loss, Gary L. Maybe maybe that's what De- Deagle's talking about. <laughs> We finally figure out all these, uh, we're infiltrated and surrounded, and we finally banish all these people that have been subverting us. And our, our population of the, of the people that support the land actually reduced to 100 million people instead of 300 million, because two-thirds of them were, were enemies of our, of our, of our own uh, nature. Anyway, so what's coming at us? Uh, I want to maybe do a product development question for Behind the Woodshed. Uh, ideas, inventions, and innovations of what the military might be throwing at us. It's fascinating what they're doing anymore. Flying robot as nimble in flight as an insect. A novel insect-inspired flying robot. We're not talking surveillance and all this other stuff. And then we also have the idea that they can be weaponized to come after you when they identify you. These little drones that now fly like a uh, fly like a butterfly would sting like a bee, I suppose. The novel insect-inspired uh, flying robot developed by T.U. Delft Researchers from the Micro Air Vehicle Laboratory has been pre- presented in Science a Magazine or some periodical experiments with this first autonomous free-flying and agile flapping wing robot carried out in collaboration with the uh, collaboration, remember, in uh, Wagon Gen, Gen University and research improved our understanding on how fruit flies control aggressive escape maneuvers. Apart from its further potential, in insect flight research, the robot's exceptional flight qualities open up new drone applications. So let me stop there. It's fascinating to watch this thing. You don't think that it can be maneuverable uh, very and very fast, but it is for as fragile as it looks. It moves pretty cool. My question behind the woodshed is looking at this through the worst-case scenario, and they talk about drones, and then they have the killer drones, and we know North, North Dakota has already agreed you could put a you can have a weapon-carrying drone. They've already agreed to this, and I think another two states did it as well. These are going to be possibly weaponized. What I want to know from behind the woodshed, you know we have the uh, the ACME, 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 uh, um, uh, Coyote, Wild E. Coyote umbrella to protect us and shield us from things like the giant meteor. 
what I wanted to know whether or not, and from from those of you, you can maybe send me emails or whatever you want to do, respond whether or not I need to invest in R and D uh, to modify because of the agility of this robot that flies like a like a, a, a fruit fly. I don't know if you ever tried to catch a fruit fly. These are pretty tough, and they're small, and they're agile, and they're quick, and this thing kind of does that. It's pretty. But my question now is, do I have to now put some time, energy, maybe expense? into redesigning the Acme tennis racket defense system against small robots. Is, is this going to be too agile for my tennis racket? If so, do I need to make some investment in the Acme tennis racket drone killer? Because I think that's going to be one of the major, major defense mechanisms that we have against these killer robots. Only I now see that they're so fast you're all going to have to buy a pair of these Acme tennis racket drone killers because they're coming that fast. We have to use Florentine-style whacking. And so I want to know a little bit whether or not I'm going to have to modify these. I have some ideas, so maybe you can contribute too. Along with the Acme uh, umbrella, and we can have the... I also remember we have the Acme uh, dual pail of sand. You stick your head. Those of you that want to, you can carry around your own pail of sand to stick your head in. We now have to worry about modifying in this affront to us with weaponized robots that fly like a better than a butterfly and sting like a bee actually can kill you. Do I have to modify that 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 tennis racket? Because I want to make sure I'm ahead of, ahead of the game. We got to we got to put investment in uh, in our defenses here, folks, in the war against us. And uh, so I'm real concerned. That did come up. I'm fascinated with the technology, but we have to be one step ahead. So I appreciate any any contributions you can behind which said. On, on doing that. Uh, ten years after the crash, we've learned nothing. Now we go to the other war against us is economics, monetary and fiscal. Ten years after the war, uh, <laughs> the war attack, the battlefield of 2008, remember the financial destruction, it was planned, folks, and we're going to now see lots of people that are discussing this. Never forget all this, how this works. Understand also they attacked your titles and your property and right now there's a doctrine going through the courts that eliminates, if you don't have an attorney to defend yourself, you're going to be destroyed by this doctrine which gives the power to the people that stole your property through these title acquisitions, through the false mortgages. Ten years ago today, on September 13th, that puts us, what, three days out, the New York Federal Reserve was a zoo. Imagine NASA headquarters on the day a giant asteroid careens into the atmosphere. All you all just opened up your Acme umbrellas, right? And we all were saved. Uh, so you get that behind the woodshed when I finally get to a website to sell them. But anyway, any rate, that was uh, the New York Fed. All hands on deck. Peak human panic. The crowd included a f future Treasury Secretary, Timothy Geithner, the Treasury Secretary and former Goldman Sachs CEO, Hank Paulson, the representatives of the multi-regulatory offices, and the uh, CEOs of virtually every major bank in, the, in New York, and even toting armies of bean counters and bankers. Well, there it is, folks, the bean counters and the risk assessment. Everything that's on your world, on your life right now, uh, the ast asteroid metaphor fit. So maybe we already got hit by the giant asteroid and didn't know it. In the war, they were directing the space call the space uh, cadets directed this as uh, the financial uh, economic asteroid in on us, and we missed it, folks. Ten years ago, this is under, and we're still under it. Uh, never forget. This is the things I'm telling you. You have to start. What do we get, do to fight the controllers? Get remove yourself from the ability for them to uh, put you in their sights. Remember the too big to fail thing. These are, people are brilliant, actually. And then they brought it in on the national, on the uh, what is it, the national security. Brilliant. Well, thank you for tuning in today. I hope something I said will help you out. Remember, thank you for what you do at reallibertymedia.com. Uh, anybody that posts and mirrors the project, uh, the, the broadcast, I appreciate it. Jules over at UCY, thank you for this uh, every every week. I appreciate it. And I'll see you next week. Tech diffs are nature willing. Well, that's another lesson. I hope with today's information you can take it to those that misbehave. From behind the woodshed, leaving his mark on the beast, this is Hal Anthony. Till next time, Journey with Purpose.
that's what opening up a can of whoop-ass feels like. Son, you just opened a whole case of whoop-ass. <laughs>